All right, fellas. So um, as I said before, we'll kind of be doing things a little bit differently today. Uh, we'll be covering only one chapter, which is Exodus 29, which kind of covers the uh, consecration. And it's kind of funny that uh, it wasn't last session, but I believe this session before is where somebody asked uh, about like what the process is of being consecrated means. And so uh, we'll be going through that actual process today and uh, uh, with us having plenty of time to be able to talk, I hope we all kind of get into some good discussions. And if we have any questions, uh, make it known. No need to be shy. Uh, so yeah, let's go ahead and start with uh, verse one through nine. Uh, one through nine, I got you. Uh, this is what you are to do to consecrate them. So they may serve me as priests. Take a young bull and two rams without defect. And from the finest wheat flour, make round loaves without yeast, thick loaves without yeast, and with olive oil mixed in, and thin loaves without yeast and brushed with olive oil. Put them in a basket and present them along with the bull and the two rams. Then bring Aaron and his sons to, an, to the entrance to the tent of meeting and wash them with water. Take the garments and dress, dress Aaron with the tunic, the robe of the robe of the ephod, ephod, the robe of the ephod, the ephod itself, and the breastpiece. Fasten the ephod on him by its skillfully woven waistband. Put the turban on his head and attach the sacred emblem to the turban. Take the anointing oil and anoint him by pouring it on his head. Bring his sons and dress them in tunics and fasten caps on them. Then tie sashes on Aaron and his sons. The priesthood is theirs by a lasting ordinance. Uh, then you shall ordain Aaron and his sons. Amen. Um, anything on this, guys? Uh, yeah, so, um, so regarding the section, when, uh, when they, uh, essentially stripped down uh, Aaron and his uh, sons and washed them. Uh, I noticed that they're doing this, like, not in, like, the privacy of uh, of a hidden tent anywhere. It's pretty much out there for, uh, for everyone there to see. And I felt that was, like, so uh, symbolic with how, uh, how baptism works, how essentially cleansing yourself uh, works where you know you're uh they're they're out here uh stripped down completely naked and it's basically as if they're uh you know they're allowing themselves to be uh to be cleansed in the presence of god in front of everyone rather than uh doing that uh in private where no one could see them and they could just later say yeah i, I did it and no one else would be none the wiser here everyone can everyone can see that everyone can see that they've uh you know, they're allowing themselves to be cleansed. They're allowing themselves to be uh, naked in front of other people too. That's something that uh, <laughs> a lot of us here can't do because um, we we feel too uh, too shy. Uh, you know, not about just uh, our bodies, but a lot of folks are just shy to really admit that you know, hey, uh, you know, I'm yeah, I'm a Christian. I believe in God. You know, I I definitely believe in uh, you know what God teaches in the Bible. Not not many folks uh, openly proclaim that uh those that say you know yeah i know god but when someone asks them uh you know hey do you believe in god you know they're they're kind of uh hesitant with how they answer um so i so i like the section where it's just like this is a public cleansing you know it's uh they're just letting themselves uh be known that you know they're they're doing this for god it's not a uh it's not a behind closed door sort of ritual yeah that's actually a brilliant uh, observation towards that um anyone else okay um, um one thing that I, go ahead uh it's just fake uh five so that, um it was i believe verse seven um Kind of remind me of like a foot back. So when said take the anointed oil and anointed him by pouring it on hair. Kind of reminds me of when I was young, almost every morning I believe we did uh 
Our mom, will, uh, we will say our morning blessings and it's anointed on our head uh, every morning. So that just brought, uh, brought me back to that memory and I was glad I thought about that. Yeah, did you ever wonder what that meant? Because uh, my parents- I did wonder, wonder, I did wonder for a while and then uh, to explain it um, briefly, it was just, um, how can we call it at the time? Do you know now? Yeah, I know now. I don't know if I got, uh, maybe not enough to like explain it well, but to like, I was explaining it. I didn't give it a shot. <laughs> it was, um, man, where well, have you got it? So I know it. I had it. I had it. I was off. I had it and it was just gone. It's all good. Uh, does anybody else know? Uh, what was the question? So, um, Avery was recalling back to where, uh, when he was young, that uh, at certain points, like his, his family would uh, place like oil on it, like anoint his head with oil. Uh, and they would all say, you know, a prayer or something like that. And I was asking if, you know, does he recall what that meant? Uh, and I think he knows but uh, I, I'm assuming he's unsure of himself, so he's not going to answer. And so I was yeah. if anybody else does. Uh, the oil is supposed to represent the uh, Holy Spirit, correct? Correct. And so... Um, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And so when you're... Basically, when you were young, and I mean, you could even do it now. It's not yeah. really age limit um but essentially you know and because my parents did the same thing when i was younger um, i kind of know now with context but uh, the anointing of oil is basically like basically it's a protection to where it's like it's saying like you you want that whenever you anoint something it's like you're saying that the Holy Spirit, you want the Holy Spirit to be able to cover it in that, uh, like there was one thing that uh, Jesus did with his disciples often uh, before he went uh, and you know, he was crucified. Um, he even went by and, you know, anointed all of his disciples and things like that and gave them the message that, you know, after he leaves, the Holy Spirit is going to come by and advise them and serve in his place and he'll be with them forever, right? And so uh, when we go through and we anoint things or um, I forgot which stories it was, but it was like, um, actually, I think it was even in Genesis to where uh, they didn't, I don't think they used oil, but when they, uh, when the certain plagues were going by and did I say Genesis? That's an Exodus, sorry. Um, to where uh, the families that did not want their firstborn sons or uh, their children to be uh, to be killed in their sleep, they would go through and basically almost anoint their household. And so I know, like in the in the actual uh, in Exodus, when the plague was going by, it was actually blood, but the oil is kind of symbolism for the blood of Jesus Christ or the Holy Spirit to cover, you know, or protect, you know, that person, that family, or anything of that nature. And so um, if I'm missing any uh, German, Sean, if I'm missing anything, let me know. But uh, that's kind of how I learned it. I was, I was, I was, Lamb's blood, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I know it was Lamb's blood to be, uh, you know, placed over the door frame of the, of the household. And so as, hmm? mm -hmm. and so as the Lord was walking through the streets, you know, the ones that didn't have the blood over the the door frame, their firstborn, or even like their, like, 
even in like even in amongst their animals, like the firstborn would be killed. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, and so uh, once again, the anointing oil kind of serves in the same purpose in that you want your the things that you anoint with the oil is like you want that to be protected by the Holy Spirit or covered in the uh, in the Holy Spirit. You know what I mean? Hopefully that made sense. <laughs> Nobody's talking back to me. Um, anything else from this section, guys? What's up, Sean? Yeah, what's up? I'm trying to think if I want to say anything. Why not? We, we got it. so much time to just be able to talk, man. Just get out. All right. Yeah, okay, I'm gonna just start off with, uh, let's start off with verse one. So verse one, Exodus 29 says, and this is the thing that thou shalt do unto them to hollow them, to minister unto me in the priest's office. All right. So what does hollow mean? Like this is a King James version, by the way. Yeah. Uh, it's something sacred um because i've heard i've heard the term on hollowed ground um uh oh ain't there hollow be their name the lord I, I think that's hallowed not hollowed okay wait so we're going hell hollow or with the a or hollow it's with the a <laughs> oh so okay. it's with an a okay yeah Okay. Yeah. So, uh, so essentially the, uh, so the main, uh, objective of, uh, the consecration of, uh, Aaron and his sons is basically to, uh, set them, uh, set them apart or set them aside, uh, with the, uh, how I worded with the, uh, intent of, uh, I don't want to say using them for God's purpose, but uh, right. something to uh, let them stand out as far as being representatives of uh, God's authority. Right. And then another question I had was like, what do you, what did God mean by minister unto me? Because that, that's what all y'all versions said, right? Like they're supposed to minister to me. Like, how did y'all take that part? Uh, so they minister unto me. Um, in our versions, I believe it says that we, yes, the, they may uh serve me as priests. Okay. Um, so it's basically putting them into uh into God's uh God's own service. Um, sorry about that. I had to step away for a second. Well, that's cool. It's all good. Yeah, Cam was answering the other question I had. Like, uh, what did you think God meant when he said, and they should minister unto me in the priest's office in Exodus 29, that second part? Uh, 29 verse 1. You're looking at the King James? Yeah. And I was saying, what did y'all heard us say, too? Like in Exodus 29, 1, that last part, minister unto me. It says, what? Man, if this window won't go away. Uh, I'm in shambles right now. <laughs> uh, I should have just pulled this up on my phone. I have it up on my laptop from right now. Give me a second. <clears throat> all right so verse one says in completion it says this is what you are to do to consecrate them so they may serve me as priests uh take a young bull and two rams without defect and so yours said they shall minister unto me mm -hmm. in the priest's office yeah so basically so that they represent me you know um and so that way they're not speaking from their own, you know, 
own objective or acting on their own objective, but acting in, um, I guess, in partnership with the Lord and the things that the Lord wants them to do. Mm -hmm. I mean, no. Yeah, Cam, did you finish your answer that you wanted to give? Uh, yeah, I did. Okay. Yeah, the first thing I got was like this ceremony wasn't just for anyone. Like this ceremony was for Aaron and his sons. Like, so God chose who he wanted his priest to be, like who he wanted to minister unto him. So uh yeah, that that stuck out to me because like everybody say they want to preach. A lot of people say they want to preach or they want to do something, but did God call you to do it? Yep. You know, and if God didn't call you to do it, it ain't gonna work out. You're just going to put yourself through struggles and hurdles and obstacles that you weren't called to, or fit or equipped it to do, which is another thing. Like, I'm going to just go ahead and skip to another thing I was going to say. Like, you know, we got to that part where he says you should, you know, put on his garment. So verse five, you know, and thou shalt take the garments and put upon Aaron the coat, right? So this is the same priestly garment he had on in uh, Exodus 28, right? And like, yeah. the thing about the garment is like, you couldn't put on a garment if you weren't cleansed, first of all. Like you had to have been cleansed in order to put on a priestly garment. And then on top of that, the uh, this you can't put on your own clothes. You gotta put on God's clothes, right? So he had to put on the yeah. garments that were given by God, that God had ordained to put on. Like that, that is so powerful. Like, <laughs> This, this all is like crazy. I'm just gonna say my points. I want you guys to like think about it. And then like these clothes, like they're freely given by God. Like, you know, they didn't have to work for it. They didn't have to labor for it. They didn't have to have this, this skill to make it by themselves. Like all they had to do was put it on. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And they only received it. And then they wore, it, they wore it by faith. Like if I wear this, I won't die in the tabernacle. If I wear this, like, it will ple be pleasing unto the Lord. Like if I do this and do exactly as God says, like he'll be pleased with me. He'll go well with me in the, the whole nation. You know what I mean? Cause you're a priest. You're an example. Oh, <laughs> you're the one that does everything. The people don't have to do it. You do. You know what I'm saying? Like that is so powerful. So like, like this points to a lot of things in the new Testament. Like I, I haven't even said everything I was trying to say, but like, you know, as a child of God, you're supposed to put on the garments. Like that's all like New Testament verses. So I'm about to say what they are in a minute, but like, you know, Jesus provided these garments for you to put on. So like, if I was to ask you, what are the garments? You know, tell me, you know, he paid the, he paid his own, he paid his own uh, price. Well, he paid the price so that you don't have to pay the price to put on something that he, only he could have gave you. You couldn't get this by yourself. You know what I mean? Like it was, yeah. it was, it was mm -hmm. paid with love and freely bestowed upon you. So like, yeah, I mean, like what question did I just ask? I just asked like, what, what, what's what the garment? The like, yeah, what is, what is it that God wants to put on you? Like, if you had to answer that question, like what, what everything that we just said just now. Hmm. Is that a loaded I, question? I, I always no, I was going to say, um, honestly, ever since I, uh, I think it was, it's, it's not in Philippians, but the, uh, as far as putting on the full armor of God, mm -hmm. when I, when I read, like, or when I read those things, it's like, um, uh, you know, you think about like the breastplate of salvation, you know, the helmet of, um, oh man, but. I gotta remember. <laughs> I, I gotta actually start committing that to memory. But um, you know, just thinking about all the things where the fact that it's like it's an armor of God, not like a robe or or like a shirt or or something like flimsy, but something that provides protection, something that uh, you know you put on to be able to either defend yourself or to allow God to be able to defend you or to give you courage or you know, that motivation to be able to, you know, keep going through by faith, you know, uh, that's, that's been my, like my garments, the garments that I need to wear, you know what I mean? Okay. And so, 
That's my answer. <laughs> hey, Cam, were you going to answer that question? Uh, I was, yeah, I was going to uh, answer for mine. Um, I feel with me, uh, the garments that uh, God wants me to put on is just really just reaffirming uh, my relationship with him. Uh, Cause it had been a pretty long gap in time uh, since I had last like really uh, studied uh, the word or, you know, anything related uh, to the Bible as far as uh, truly studying it, uh, you know, praying every day, uh, you know, making sure I attend church with my aunt, you know, just a lot of, uh, a lot of things I used to do in my youth, but I had uh, fell off from it uh, for a pretty long time. Um, so really it's just a, just a way of uh, rebuilding that uh, for myself because God definitely could have uh, <laughs> could have just left me to my own devices and eventually just let me uh, go down a path that probably would have led up to my uh, spiritual death. Not like actual for real death, but you all know what I mean. Um, so he was able to give me an opportunity to really just uh, get back to it. Um, and that was in the form of uh, Miles and Germ uh, initially invited me to these uh, to the studies that was only just these two, them two, um, and so you know since then you know I've been uh, you know I've been pretty pretty good uh, you know with what I've been uh, studying and how I've been uh, re-examining everything that's been going on in my life, just truly really enjoying what uh, God provided for me. So that's been my uh, that's been my garment. For my protection. Hey, Abe and Jerry, y'all want to answer that question? Like, what garments uh, is God trying to put on you? Like, how did you take the garments, that verse? I don't remember how I asked um, it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, you say how the um... how did I ask it, Cam and uh, Miles? I don't remember. You you were basically saying that um, you know the the garments that that were made for you it was like it was made by God and so what do you think or what do you feel is the garments that God is trying to tell you to put on in faith you know what I mean yeah uh, I feel like um, God that kind of sense put on me uh to my uh i believe it is just a knowledge and understanding of his word and just having his presence around is uh protected itself from like from not just from sinners but from those uh just uh temptation and manipulation that comes across me throughout the wild so yeah, it's mainly his spiritual presence that's I feel with garments. All right. Yeah, one thing I was gonna say, um, I'll just keep on going. Um, but yeah, when it came to just putting on the garments, right? Like I'm just go ahead and read the verses because I wasn't gonna go back to it, but I'm just gonna go to it now. So y'all yeah, remember how in the book of Revelation it says John uh the disciple John writing out a vision that God gave him while he was on the island of Patmos or something like that. And he was on there because like they basically sent him to his death. So he's all alone. It's an island for prisoners to be isolated from society that were a problem. So it's basically a prison, but it wasn't a prison because, you know, God came upon John and gave him a vision. And the, the whole vision of the book of Revelation is just like everything in heaven, right? So Revelation three verse five it says he who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments right so the same garment that's that uh the priests have to put on here this is what it's talking about right like the tabernacle again you know signifies and points out like how everything operates in heaven and like just how it is in the throne room how it is and just like, how everything operates right that's just one one symbolization uh, of what the tabernacle is so like for us, like, you know, we're going to be clothed in white garments one day in heaven. And then even now, like God clothes us right now. We'll talk about that in a second. 
So let me finish that verse. He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. Man, that verse just touches everything we've been talking about, man. Like with the, with the breastplate and the 12 tribes on the breastplate. Then you got the two, uh, what's it called? Onyx stones on the shoulders. And then, um, yeah, and it got our names on it, right? So God comes before, I mean, Jesus comes, to, Jesus is the high priest, right? We saw that first uh, last study. And he keeps on coming before God and he confesses our names before the father and his angels continually. Like, and our names are written in the book of life. Like our names are everywhere, right? So <laughs> it continue, it's continual remembrance, you know, of the father, you know, about us and what, you know, what we need and because we can't live without him. Like it's so powerful because the next chapter that we're going to talk about with you know, Exodus 30 talks about this exact point that I'm making. Y'all going y'all gonna to remember, man, like for real. But like, yeah, one thing that gets me is like, just a side note, is anybody that says you can lose your salvation? Like, that's just saying that God can lose something. Can God lose his car keys? So God, like, does he mess up and fails at something? Like, to so for someone to say that you can lose your salvation, that's what I think about, you know? And that verse right there, that's just another verse that proves, like, I will not blot out his name from the book of life. Like, once you're saved, you're saved. You don't got to do anything. It's the work of God. It's the work of Jesus. So for someone to say you can lose your salvation, that means you weren't saved to begin with, because it's a work that you couldn't do by yourself. Could Aaron and his sons have become priests by themselves and just do it any kind of way? Like, no, like they had to do it in the exact way that God told them to do. And they couldn't do it just from their own thoughts or anything. Like they had to be commanded. They had to be told what to do, how to live. Like, this is why you don't boast. And that goes to Ephesians 2, verse 8, you know, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves. It is a gift of God. Like, your garments, the help that God gives you, like the the provision that he continually gives you through life, just what Jesus did on the cross for our sins, man, like this is a gift of God. God didn't have to do that for you, but he did. He didn't have to appoint you. He didn't have to call you. Like, uh, yeah, man, let's keep on going. Like uh, I'm going back up because Cam brought up that another thing that stuck out to me was the washing. Like, man, like you have to be washed before God can use you. You know what I'm saying? Like before Aaron and his sons could even, first of all, this ceremony was done, you know, outside the tabernacle, right? So they couldn't go in the holy place yet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then this washing only happened once. Like this was a one-time event. It didn't happen continually. Like, and that is so powerful. Like, cause, cause y'all remember that verse in, uh, did y'all ever hear the story when uh, Peter, well, when Jesus was washing the disciples' feet, but before the story even started, like the disciple, Jesus told the disciples like to wash one another's feet. And they were looking at each other like, what? Wash each other's feet. And back in that time period, you know, everybody was barefoot for the most part or had sandals. So their feet were real yeah. dusty and crusty and ugly and everything like that. So just him saying, you should, you know, get down on your knees and wash somebody's feet. Another man's like, you crazy, Jesus. No, like, and you know what Jesus did? He washed their feet. Like, <laughs> And then Peter was like, no, like, Jesus, you're not washing my feet. You know, I, I can't handle that. But Jesus was like, man, if, if I don't wash your feet, you'll have nothing to do with me. You can't be a part. You're not a part of me. And Jesus was like, oh, I mean, Peter was like, okay, if you, if you need to wash me. You're going to wash everything. Yeah, yeah. you're going to wash my feet. Like, wash everything. Like, and that's how Peter is. I'm exactly like Peter. I, don't, I love Peter, bro, because, like, I'm all in. I think y'all know that about me. If I study, if I have a Bible study, I'm going to study till the break of dawn. So I can't study no more until I know way too much. And then, it, you know, I don't care because that's just what I got to give to God or with anything. Like, if I bowl against you, I'm going to try my best to demolish you. Cam and Jerry, no, like, I'm too competitive. Like, <laughs> so, like, yeah, Peter's the same way, man. Like, but at the end, Jesus was like, man, it, it doesn't take all that. You know, he's, this is what he said in verse 10 in John 13. He said, Jesus answered, uh, those, who have, uh, those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean. You are clean, though not every one of you. So he was talking about Judas, right? But mm -hmm. like once you've been washed in the blood, man, once Jesus, once you come to Christ, see, this is what it's talking about, man. Once you've been washed for your sins, once you're born again, like you don't need to continually come to the altar when 
the preacher says, you know, if anybody want to come to Christ, you know, come now. Like, you want to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Like, you've already been washed. You've already accepted. Like, it's been done. Once you're born again, that's it. Like, you don't need to be born 20 times. Like, <laughs> it's, it's over with. So, in the same analogy, some, some pastor said it one time. He said, like, when you take a shower in the in the daytime, like, you know, for, to start off your day, you don't take a shower 20 times in one day, right? Just to get clean again. Like you only take it once and then and then you're set for the whole day. It's the same thing. Like once you washed up and you done took a shower, if you need to wash your face late, late at night, that's fine. Wash your face. You need to wash your hands after peeing. That's fine. You don't need to wash your whole body again. Right. So it's the same thing. Like, um, but hey, I'm going to stop before I say anything else. But anybody else got something you want to say? Because I got a few questions yeah. to ask just when it comes back. Yeah. What's up? Yeah, I actually wanted to ask if anybody uh, knew why they needed two rams without defect. Did anybody really ever like think about that? It's like they could have just brought brought some broken down, you know, ram or some ram that's like overly rambunctious. Right. <laughs> really. Oh, yeah. I, I would say got you that talking, didn't? <laughs> I would say is definitely a representation of how we're supposed to be giving uh, nothing but our best to God. We shouldn't be uh, half-hearting it by, you know, giving something that uh, is either imperfect or it's only okay. It needs to be like the the cream of the crop, the the creme de la creme. I apologize if I uh, offend anyone that actually knows how to speak French, but. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know, it's it's other where we're we're not just uh, we're not just giving a little bit uh, to God and calling it a day. You know, we're making sure that you know this after what He's done for us. This is the it's the least we could do. It, it's something that is perfect all around, doesn't have any major defects or any defects at all. You know, just uh, giving our best. Okay, that's that's a good answer. Uh, and, and it is correct, but uh, there's also another thing that I wanted to see if anybody picked up on. I just want to say the answers Cam give are so profound. That was really profound, Cam. Thank <laughs> Thank, thanks for that. <laughs> that was great. So um, nobody else had an answer to this. Hey, yeah, good. So, um, where are we? <laughs> <laughs> Like which section are we in? Because I know we're through one, one through nine. First, okay, so we're, we're still in the, the first, first one. Yeah. Okay, because I thought the next section was about the um, sacrifice versus sacrifice. I, I wanted to talk. About that. Well, like, you're gonna I, cover. I you're you're gonna. Just go ahead. I just want to know where we were before I said it. Yeah, we're at the end of verse nine. Okay. And I, and I'm only referencing verse one. In, in the two rams without a uh, defect. Mm -hmm. And so um, the other reason why I think that it had to be a rams without defect, because it was also a representation of Jesus in that whenever Jesus was, you know, given as a sacrifice, you know, by God to us for us to be cleansed of our sins, you know, Jesus was perfect. You think about that. There was no reason for him to ever even be, you know, sacrificed or to be, uh, you know, put to death. The only reason why he did is because, you know, <laughs> God ordered him to do so. And so um, I thought that was interesting in that um, even in this, this ritual of, you know, you know, God really taking something that he wants for us as far as just to be, you know, you know, sanctified and uh, to be holy and separate from, you know, from, you know, our sin in that, you know, in this, you know, God wants only for us to give up something that he's giving us, given us to get something better or to be, to receive something better. And so that, uh, so like, when we look at Jesus and how, you know, the disciples originally, when they heard that Jesus was going to get, you know, eventually going to leave them, 
Jesus had given them, uh, you know, they, they were, you know, they were worried. They didn't know how they were going to live. They didn't know how, you know, what life they were going to have without Jesus being, you know, their mentor, their, their teacher, without Jesus being in their lives. They didn't know who they were supposed to be. And so Jesus gave them comfort in saying that, you know, I will be leaving you, but in my place, I'm sending you some, something so much better than myself in that, you know, they'll receive the Holy Spirit and even down to, you know, us as Christ believers and Christ followers that we would receive the Holy Spirit. And so um, if you think about it, they had to only give up something that they wanted as far as, you know, the perfect, their, their good, their good offering the best that they can to be able to receive something better. You know, I thought that was interesting. Um, trying to see if I had any other questions towards this. Um, I, th I think that's all I have for that section for now. Um, I, I mean, we got time, so I'm a, I'm gonna keep on going, guys, because like this is my specialty. Like I have a problem with just talking forever. Like I can't shorten up stuff for three minutes or fifty nine seconds unless I do a clip of like every um like an hour sermon I did or something. You know what I mean? So like yeah, yeah, we're trying to do this whole chapter in, in two hours or one hour. I don't know, but <laughs> I'm just yeah, you know, I want to prolong it. It's, well, not prolong it, but you know what I mean. Get everything we can from it. So. um I was gonna ask you guys, how do you get washed? Like based on everything we've been saying, how do you get washed? And, and what kind of washing do we need today? And is it relevant still today to get washed? Like Aaron and, the, and his sons had to get, even to go into the tabernacle, which is God's presence. I don't know if I understand your question for like, I understand your question, but I don't know how to answer it, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, so in the context of the scripture, you're asking how do we get washed or as in uh, how are our sins cleansed or how do we prepare ourselves for uh, our sins to be cleansed? Yeah, I think that's all. I think that all entails washing. I'm just making sure, man. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you talking about extra shower? <laughs> <laughs> um, honestly, I don't. I don't have a, like a profound answer for this, other than you know, uh, in order for us to be prepared to, um, I guess when when we're cleansing ourselves of our sins, we're repenting, and so it's like. In, in, I guess, in our, in our preparation to repent, um, I guess we just pray that, <laughs> we just pray that everything's made, like, clean in, in that we can recognize, you know, what, what it is that is separating us from God, and then that way we're able to sacrifice it, essentially, kind of like what they're doing. Um, uh, so I guess it's ultimately like through prayer or through um, kind of coming to the realization of the things that you're doing wrong and being clean, clean and like being, I guess, exposed <laughs> before God. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Anybody else want to crack at that question? Yeah, the follow up of Miles, I was going to say is really through prayer, but also kind of, um, Really preparing yourself for not only what's um, going to come to you during the day, but also the unknown too, because there will be a lot of unknown factors that will be thrown at your way throughout the day, a week or so. And those unknown factors could be just that, like, could be from sins or uh, wild or temptation. And it's just um, that preparation for it too. Yeah. And also, in another way, it's just really just to look at yourself and uh, and like not be too prideful in yourself, or like I learned to accept that you're wrong time yeah. to time. And, All right. And, yeah, learn to accept that you're wrong and uh, learn that. Um, <laughs> I 
I kind of get what you're saying in that, uh, like in this context of like being washed, you got to recognize that you're dirty. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Here you go. Yeah. I mean, that's that's the biggest point because Cam tore it up to start it off. Bro. The first thing Cam said, bro, was like Aaron and his sons didn't wash themselves, bro. Like they had to be in front of the tent, right? And somebody else washed them, bro. Like I'm gonna put emphasis on that. Somebody else washed them. Like <laughs> they couldn't wash themselves. Like that is so powerful, bro. Like that just literally points to Jesus again. Like you can't wash yourself. You can't do the work and be saved by yourself. Like, this is a work from God, bro. Like, that was the first point that I had. Then the second point was, like, Cam already said you got to humble yourselves. So, like, you can't be cleansed from your sins unless you're humble. You know how God's in his, in his word, the whole New Testament, bro. God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble, man. You know, he gives more grace to the humble, bro. Like, and then even in Proverbs, y'all read Proverbs, man. The downfall of all men is pride. It's the reason why Satan fell from heaven is because of pride. He thought he could do it himself. He thought he had a better way. But like Aaron and his sons, bro, like they humbled themselves before the Lord and, and did it publicly in front of everybody. Did it boldly, bro. Like that's a Christian, man. So to answer your question, like how do you get washed? Like y'all answered it, bro. Like uh, another way is just, you know, so humbling yourself, right? Uh, reading your Bible. That's another thing too. Like how you get washed every day, bro? Because really you need to be washed every day, right? Just like you, you washed up your body every day on the outside physically, you need to wash your soul. You need to wash the inside of yourself. So how's your inside doing? How's your, how's your inner man doing? How is your spiritual self doing? Because that's what really matters, right? Is somebody trying to say something? I feel like I heard somebody. Okay, I, I guess I didn't. But. No. <laughs> <laughs> my my hear me choking on a little bit of water, but. Oh, the goat. <laughs> I heard the goat. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but yeah, man, like this, this is so powerful, bro. Because, you know, every day we need to be cleansed. You know what I'm saying? Just like you wash up phys- physically, you need to wash up mentally, like spiritually, bro. Like God, the first commandment, man, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul. All that stuff's inside of you. How are you going to wash that? Like that's why so many people commit suicide. That's why we're rich people who have everything are so miserable. Like I feel so... One person I, re- I wish I knew was Demi Lovato. I love Demi Lovato. I don't know what it is about oh, her. Yeah, it ain't man. just she hot. I don't oh. care about that. But I just wish I knew her, like, just to be friends with her, be there for her, pray for her. Whatever she needs, I would do. You know what I'm saying? Because, like, people like that, man, they don't have their in- – they have something missing. They know something's missing. And what's missing is the cleansing. You know what I mean? Like, you can't get this any kind of, like, spiritual – you can't do this just from any spiritual activity. Like, it only comes from God, bro, this kind of washing. So, man, yeah, and it's the work of the Holy Spirit, man. I haven't even talked about verse 7, which was the oil, you know what I'm saying? So, yeah, I'm going to wait for somebody else to say something, because I, I I know I heard you, uh, Miles. Oh, I didn't say anything. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, one of my favorite verses, bro, is like 1 John 1, 9. It says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us of our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Like, you got to come to God this kind of way, bro. Like, this is, when we go through this whole chapter, man, everything's going to keep on reiterating itself like crazy. Like, I'm going to go back to concentrate, concentration, you know, concentrating, like, concent- you get what I'm trying to say, the ceremony of concentration. All right. So, all who are employed by, for God are to be sanctified by him. That's one of the points I had. Like, if God calls you, bro, like, he's going to sanctify you. And like, you gotta be per- accepted by God in order to perform anything that he wants you to perform or anything he calls you to perform. Like, if you're not accepted by him and he didn't call you to be in the tent, you're gonna die. It ain't gonna work out for you. So like, man, like, consecrating, uh, so him consecrating Aaron and his sons was perfecting them. It was getting them ready for the task, bro. Like, and it's a one-time thing, again, like, so this points again to us. I want you guys to keep on thinking about us and Christianity and everything with all this. Like, and then consecration couldn't just happen. It, it took the shedding of the blood, right? So Jesus on the cross, like his that one time payment kept us from having to kill animals continually. Like, right. <laughs> and then also, like, uh, it couldn't just happen because uh, well, consecration couldn't just couldn't happen without true fellowship with God. Like, you gotta know God in order to get this close to God. You know what I mean? Like, 
because eventually they're going to eat some bread like you know and this is an act of fellowship with them in exodus 29 too right but you're not going to get that close with him if you don't know god you're not if you don't come where he is you know what i mean he didn't call you right and that oh man that's so powerful like you know how people debate like if uh free will they the people debate free will like they say like because they contradict it with like uh how in the bible like god appoints everything like so if you're not saved like how can you serve a god who appoints people to the hell like because he's all knowing right he 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 for he, he uh controls everybody's destiny you know essentially right so people who go to hell he, he called them to go to hell right so like yeah it's stuff like that man yeah. <laughs> you yeah. say you say you never heard that no, I, I, I've heard that before. I was just saying that 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 just sounds wrong. Yeah, but yeah, man, you want to be close to God and get this close to Him, like we saw with the tabernacle photo photo we've been seeing with uh, Exodus twenty five to twenty eight. Like, man, you want to have fellowship with Him, bro? It takes sacrifice, bro. Like, there's a lot of factors. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm I'm done. I mean, I keep on. There's one more point I had with seven, but I'm pretty sure we'll come back to it. Yeah, let's let's keep reading. Uh, yeah. For now, we'll we'll move back uh, based on whatever points. Um, let's see. Um, somebody read ten through eighteen. Let's do that. Yeah, good. Bring the bull to the front of the tent of Legion, and Aaron and his sons shall lay their hands on its head. Order it in the Lord present at the entrance to the tent of Legion. Take some of the bull's blood and put it on the horns of the altar with your finger, and pull out the west of it at the base of the altar. Then take all the fat on the internal organs and long move of the liver, and both kidneys with the fat on them, and burn them on the altar. But Burn the bull's flesh and its hide and its intestines outside the camp. It is a sin of fear. Yeah, fear. Take. Oh, no. So, I said, <laughs> offering. Take one of the lambs and Aaron and his son shall lay their hands on its head, slaughter it, and take the blood and splash it against the sides of the altar. Cut the lamb into pieces and wash the internal organs and the legs, putting them with the head and the other pieces. Then burn the Italian lamb on the altar. It is burnt offering to the Lord, a pleasing aroma, a food offering pleasant, present, presented to the Lord. Yeah. All right, fellas. Um, any notes on this? Yeah, so I did have a question. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, well, two actually. Um, let me start with the first one. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, Sorry. I thought no, like, you okay. Uh, <laughs> okay. 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 Uh, all right. So for uh, for thirteen to fourteen. Um, so what was the uh, Sorry, I'm losing my train of thought. What was the purpose of uh, them burning certain parts of the bowl uh within the camp but then taking other uh pieces mm. of it bring it outside I'm gonna let somebody else yeah. see if they can answer this yeah because we look in the next uh section from 15 to 18 we see that the the ram itself uh well one of the rams is uh completely burned but here uh for the bull we see essentially half of it being burned and then the uh the innards, uh, the hide, the flesh, and I think in the version that uh, that Sean is reading, it mentions like dung and stuff. So, mm -hmm. uh, so I was wondering uh, why uh, why the two different burning locations. Yeah, I want to see if anybody else has an answer to that before I do. Well, I think this is just my assumption. Uh, one of one of the reasons why if we talk about dung, it doesn't smell good. And so we, we notice in the next part of uh, says the, the yeah, the pleasing aroma in my in my version when when they burn the ram, it's um, 
something pleasing to the Lord. And, and I think the, the Bulls uh, just stinks overall. Uh, maybe God doesn't want that smell uh, in his tabernacle, I believe. I could, I could be wrong about that, but okay. more so, more so kind of know about what like the sin offering was. Um, and we, and we kind of know what this also is pointing to. I'm really grateful for Moses for writing this in this way. <laughs> Cause I think about what happens later on in sections where Aaron builds the golden calf and they, and they worship essentially a bull, you know? Um, and then maybe God was pointing to, um, that all, although this bull has a lot of meat, it's, it's also young, so it can, you know, provide the, the asset necessary to create more assets, if you will, <laughs> um, to make more of more calves, um, when it's mating and stuff like that. Um, you know, it's very, it's very valuable to, uh, people with so you know, like a bull is a worker; it's food, and it, as I said, it's it's used for more mating. So, so this is a great sacrifice, and um, yeah, like uh, I believe so that they wouldn't worship the bull and, and not forget that the bull isn't the god, but he's God. Although this is one of the, a, it, it's a young bull, so it has a long long life ahead of it, and. Uh, that's what makes it a harder sacrifice too, because they know like it has potential. But who who created it? But as g going back to your initial question about the smell, I just think it has something to do with that that it stinks, and so God doesn't want that kind of smell uh, in His sight. He wants some pleasing. Like mm -hmm. that's kind of yeah. I think that's kind of how it, it's it, it uh, smells like sin. <laughs> um, <laughs> I love y'all answers, bro. Y'all answers are so like thoughtful. Uh, Sean, before you answer this, uh, oh, let somebody else see if they can answer it. Uh, Ave, do you have anything or Jairus? Ooh. Or Sean, to cut you off. No, no, I'm not going, one? bro. It's all you. Okay. So this one, I can't think of really anything. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Jairus, do you have anything? I don't. <clears throat> you said you don't? I don't know. Okay. All right. Uh, Sean, do you know this? Or do you, uh... Yeah, I know. Oh, you don't? No, okay. I, no, I do. No, oh, he does. does. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was about to say. Um, so, uh, from a young age, guys, what do we kind of associate with a bull, especially um, a young bull? Republican. Did you say Republican? Or Democrats. What are <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> or or a bull like in uh you know how in uh trading, you know, bulls up, bears down. All right, all right. Anyone else? What kind of characteristics do bulls actually have? Uh they're strong. Uh, oh yeah, it's hard to break their pride, just like a stallion. Right. It's pride isn't they're bull stubborn. Fights. Yeah, stubborn, yes. Stubborn Especially when you think about how uh, you're, you're, they're, they're sacrificing a young bull. Right. And so that's like almost peak, like stubbornness. And um, when we think about, you know, how they have to burn it outside of the camp, everything that's kind of keeping, you know, people away from God as far as being stubborn, wanting to, handle things in their own ways, you know, hint, hint, Esau, <laughs> you know, um, it was something that it was thrown outside of the camp. They can't even eat this thing. They don't want anyone consuming it. It's kind of like how uh, you think about unleavened bread in that they don't want yeast in part of it because what does it do? It's like 
it has negative effects on you or it, it basically it was a representation of sin. And so this thing of taking a young bull and, you know, killing it and, you know, taking all these different parts out of it and burning it outside of the camp. They want all form, God wants all forms of stubbornness, anything that's going to keep you away from him to be placed outside. You don't bring that with you. And especially with these roles that they're getting ready to take on as, you know, priests, <laughs> you know, delivering God's word and sharing the things that God wants the, the people, the Israelites to do, you know? And so that's one thing. And then you look at how now you have an entire ram, because there's two of them, right? And the one ram, they want to burn the entire thing, but they're burning it on the altar. Um, what do we think about towards giving your entire something? That was a lot to lose to be able to take like a, a one ram and just don't think of anything, just burn the whole thing. And the fact that when you give your entire thing, how it can be pleasing to the Lord. It's about commitment. If you think about it, if you commit yourself completely to the Lord, it's pleasing to him. He loves knowing that even in giving your last, giving your best, you know, um, it's pleasing that the Lord can know that you're fully committed. It's like you think about how much time we put out a day you know, being able to go and, you know, study the word and then to come into Bible study and spend almost two to three hours covering, you know, things that are going to help you grow closer to him. That's commitment. And to be able to fully commit yourself and to fully, you know, no matter what the sacrifice is to give your best. And that's why it's, it's a food offering presented to the Lord and it's pleasing to him. And so it's the thing of getting rid of the stubbornness, the things that are getting that are keeping you from God and fully committing yourself to the things that the Lord um, it can, can give you and in, in, in committing yourself to doing whatever necessary or whatever it takes to be able to receive the things that God wants you to have, you know? And I'll That's go deep, in, dude. Yeah. yeah, I'll go into the 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 last the second ram uh, a little later when we read that part. But that that's pretty much what it is. And actually, I also wanted to bring out the fact that uh, verse eleven it says, "Slaughter it in the Lord's presence at the entrance for the uh, for the uh, bull." So like at the gate, like at, from the jump, he wants that thing gone <laughs> in his presence. He wants to see it happen. He wants to know that, you know, whatever, whatever is holding you back, whatever sin that is, whatever is keeping you from him, he wants that thing gone at the gate, <laughs> you know? Hmm. Sean, did I miss anything? Ah, because like the was so powerful. We went to 14, right? That's all we went to. We didn't read 15. No, we went 10 through uh 18. Oh, we did? Dang it. Okay. I'm gonna just speak. <laughs> <laughs> like, like we ain't ready for that one yet. Right. So like I'll I'll just focus on outside of camp for now. So outside of camp, you'll see that it was talking about all the flesh, right? So verse mm -hmm. 14 and mm -hmm. 36, it talks about it, but verse 14. But the flesh of the bullet, like his skin, his dung. So like Jeremiah said, the crap, the doo-doo, shall thou burn with fire without the camp. It is a sin offering. So like all the flesh got to go outside the camp. So man, like that provided again, the, the uh, sin atonement. So like, just like Jesus, you know, like Jesus was outside the camp. That's what he's known for. Like, let's read uh, Hebrews 13, 11 to 13 to bring that point out. The high priest carries the blood of animals into the most holy place as a sin offering, but the bodies are burned outside the camp. And so Jesus also suffered outside the city gate to make the people holy through his own blood. So his flesh, he died, like, right? He was crucified. Like, 
So let us then go to him outside the camp, bearing the disgrace he bore. Oh my gosh, bro. That is so powerful, guys. Like Jesus said in John 15, bro, like, I don't understand why people don't like me. I'm a very likable person. I don't see people just don't like me either because I'm black. Because you may think I'm ugly or something. May think I got a big nose. I don't know. It made my accent. And some of the words I say, I don't pronounce all of them. I don't know. But like, I'm a likable dude. But like that verse said in John 15, Jesus was like, if the world hates you, just keep in mind it hated me first. Like, is a servant greater than the master? Like if a master's hated, why in the world would somebody like their servant? You know what I'm saying? If the teachers hate it, why would they like the student? Like you're a part of the teacher's the teacher's class. Like, <laughs> so he said, if you, if, he, if you're hated among men, that just points to why you're hated. Like, cause they hated me, you know? So you don't have nothing to be worried about. So like, that is so powerful. Cause like, if they hate you, they persecute you. If you feel disgraceful, like if you feel like nobody loves you and you have no, my biggest thing was I never, before I was even saved, I never, I never fit in with anybody. Cause I fit in with everybody kind of but I never really fit in. You know what I mean? I could just relate with everybody. I'm a very relatable person. So I get in high school, I hung out with the jocks because I was one, but I, I I was like Troy Bolton. So like, I like to sing, like, but I didn't sing. I just like to draw and do other stuff. So like, <laughs> like, like yeah. So like I fit in with the jocks. I, fit, I could talk with the nerds and hang out with the nerds. I did, anytime I saw a nerd hanging out in the lunchroom by themselves, I would introduce someone other nerds that are just like them, they'll never be friendless again. Like I hung out with the gothic, the gothics. I related with everybody. So like, but I never fit in. You know what I'm saying? Only time I fit in was with other believers when I got saved. That was the only home I found. So like outside the camp, bro. Like if you're suffering in this world, it's outside the camp. So yeah, I just want to throw that out there. Let y'all say what y'all thoughts are. Yeah, I know. Um, did anybody else have something else? Uh, so I'll just say stuff. So you see how in verse 10, Aaron and his sons had to put their hands on the bull, right? On the head of the bull. Yeah. So just them that doing... Was actually... Oh, go ahead, Cam. <laughs> no, I was going to say that was uh, going to be my second question uh, that I had. I oh, was okay. going to... Uh, I was gonna ask, uh, you know, why they uh, why they put their hand on the uh, on the animals before they sacrifice them? Because um, I I don't know if it's just me uh, remembering incorrectly, but I don't think I remember uh, seeing them do this uh, previously in the other offerings. Um, so I was wondering, uh, you know, why they started doing that now? Uh, what was the uh, what was the purpose of that? Because they because they don't skip it at all. They don't. Uh, they don't put their hand on one animal and then just uh, straight up murder the other one. They, uh, you know, they put their hand on it and then that's when they, uh, when they kill the animal and then, uh, and then burn on the, uh, burn for the offerings. Right. Uh, so I was curious on that. So yeah, go ahead, Sean. Yeah. So we learned that with the washing at the tabernacle door, right? That was an aspect of like spiritual cleansing from sin. All right. So with this one, like Aaron and his sons having to put their hand on the bull, I think they had to put their hand on the two lambs, the two rams too, right? Um, so just them doing that is them uh, basically transferring their sin to the bull, like we do with Jesus. It's an innocent bull. What did the bull do? Because remember, they got to give the best. They can't give crap. So I was really thinking about this, bro. Like if you had to give your best animal, that means it's your favorite animal. That means it's the animal that gives you the least amount of trouble probably. Like, you know what I mean? It's a harmless, innocent animal. So <laughs> if it's a bull, it must be a pretty nice bull. Like, <laughs> so anyways, like you put your hand on it and you're transferring your sins and you're telling God that I confess my sins. You know what I mean? And just like that scripture verse we just read with First John uh, 1, 9, you know, if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you all unrighteousness, right? So this is the same thing. They just like literally were transferring all their sin onto this bull. And they were hoping and praying that God will accept this offering, this sacrifice, so that they could be saved, so they could be consecrated for God, right? So just like just like the priests in this text, right? Like every believer can only be consecrated uh, to God through sacrifice. 
So without a sacrifice, you can't be set apart from God. You can't be used by God without the, a sacrifice. So Jesus was that sacrifice, man. So yeah, I hope that answers your question, Cam. Or more than answers it. I always try to do more than answer <laughs> when I answer questions. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. Ah, sorry, so I stuck my throat. Yeah, definitely did. And then something else I saw too. I want to read verse twelve because I want to see how this point reson resonates. It says, "And thou shalt take of the blood of the bullock and put it upon the horns of the altar with thy finger, and pour all the blood beside the bottom of the altar." Um, okay, that didn't. I think it was. I gotta keep on reading, but I'm not gonna do it. But they said that the best of the animal was burnt before the Lord, but the rest was destroyed outside the camp. Oh, hey, that's that goes with everything we were saying. Like, why were why was it burned outside the camp? And Jeremiah said that you know the rest of the animal was burned outside the camp, but the best of the animal was burnt before the Lord. So that's 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 cool. But yeah, I just wanted to throw that out there. But man, we covered a lot. Did, so we did uh, nineteen through twenty one, or just eighteen? Uh, no, we just did ten through eighteen. All right, cool, cool. Uh, if you don't have anything else, uh, who, who else has some points or questions, actually? Mm -hmm. Got any questions? I'll make one more point, and that's it. It takes a second, 30 seconds, probably. But, like, the altar, like, we talked about this. It's the killing place, right? It's a place yeah. of death, and it, it's a place where you can become holy and consecrated to God, right? So in the New Covenant, so this is the Mosaic Covenant, but in the New Covenant, like, what's what's the killing place now? What's the place where we can, where our sins and we can be put to death and be made new and made holy and consecrated to God? Like, what is it? You guys know the answer. You're already saying it in your head. It was the first thing that came to head. Can you ask your question again? I said, what is the killing place? Like, what's the place to where our sins are put to death? And we we can become holy and consecrated to God and pleasing to him. Well, really, if that's anywhere, right? Because because of what Jesus is, it, like, inside of ourselves. Is, especially, especially, like, you know, in private, personal relationship with we know this is really holding me back. I need to give this to him, or I need to kill it. Or just actually, I like what he said earlier recognize this is something that holds us and then allowing us to, uh, allowing ourselves to be why through, through faith. Um, I didn't get to bring this up earlier. Uh, in the last section, but because this chapter, as what Sean says, it reiterates itself. Read up Galatians uh, chapter three. It is all about justification through faith. So being cleansed through faith. So the consecration that we, we gain through faith. Um, 326, uh, which is kind of like 320. Actually, I'll just read 325 through but since the faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian, for you are all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. So essentially, it, he continues to talk about us being heirs to the throne of both Jew and Gentile. But um, where the killing place is, uh, essentially, is, is, yeah, just understand that, you know, I'm guilty and I'm a sinner just like anybody else. And I, so that's my answer. <laughs> Not sure if it's. No, you write down the last part. Like, maybe, is that everybody else's answer? Like, what's the killing yeah, place? What's the offer? Anywhere that Jesus can go. <laughs> okay, yeah, okay. So, like, uh, I'll just go ahead and answer. It's the cross, right? Yeah. Is it? Uh, it's a place where you're transformed from from transformed from you know death to life. It's a place of setting you apart, you know, to bring light in your life, life more abundantly, and all that stuff. It's the cross. That's the new altar. So whatever your sin is or anything, you got to come to that altar and lay it down. For, forget about it. Like in all these ways that we're talking about here, you know, through washing and everything, like all this is, this is ridiculous, man. How the Old Testament points to the New Testament in every way. 
every verse, bro. Like the whole the whole Bible comes together. So yeah, amen. Uh, anything else from anyone else before we uh, keep going? Nothing for me. Um, Nothing for me. I'm going to read uh, 19 through 26. Yeah, I'm going to read 19 through 26. Let me see. Yeah, I'm good with that. Uh, it says, take the other ram, and Aaron and his sons shall lay hands on its head slaughter it and make of its blood will take some of its blood and put it on the lobes of the right ears of Aaron and his sons on the thumbs of their right hands and on the big toes of their right feet then splash blood against the sides of the altar and take some of the blood from the altar and some of the anointing oil and sprinkle it on Aaron and his garments and his sons and their gar and their garments sorry then he and his sons and their garments will be cons consecrated. Take from this ram the fat, the fat tail, the fat on the internal organs, the long lobe of the liver, both kidneys and well, both kidneys with the fat on them and the right thigh. This is the ram for the ordination, sorry. Uh, from the basket of the bread, made without yeast which is before the lord take one round loaf one thick loaf with an all with olive oil mixed in and one thin loaf put all of these in the hands of aaron and his sons and have them wave them before the lord as a wave offering then take from them sorry then take them from their uh their hands and burn them on the altar along with the burnt offering for a pleasing aroma to the Lord, a food offering presented to the Lord. After you take, sorry, after you take the breast of the ram for Aaron's ordination, wave it before the Lord as a wave offering and it will be your share. All right, so any questions or any comments on this? Uh, 19 through 26. So I kind of want to take it back to quickly because uh, I wanted to look at what was the significance of the first round or like why was the first completely and why was the second round used eating and stuff like that so apparently the first round was used as sacrifice for a sin offering did not just food uh, because it was completely burned up so and th this was only once per year um, the first ram was used to atone for the sins of the entire and so that obviously points to jesus and this this day uh, i forgot if it was during a festival but this day was called the and so uh, yeah that was just uh, you're kind of cutting out a bit just here and there just here and there let me back mm. He, he was cutting out for you guys as, as well, right? Yeah. Oh, okay. I ain't gonna say nothing. Uh, for me, I can still hear him. I mean, it's because he's in the next room. <laughs> I'm just kidding. No, I mean, uh, I'm on Discord. <laughs> no, we got like two doors uh, mixed between <laughs> us. That's no oh, way. That's the last time I was studying. I had problems, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I didn't have any problem. I'll just join you today. Okay. Okay, let me go back. I was going to be real upset. I thought I wasn't recording. <laughs> We're good. I'm going to open it back up. There we go. All right, so I don't know where I cut in and out at. Um, I'll just stay what I have on paper and we'll keep moving. But the first one was used as a sacrifice, um, as a sin offering for the entire nation of Israel. And so that points to to Jesus, how he's the one sacrifice that can handle all of our sins and for the entire world. So um, that's why it's completely burned up, you know. Um, 
that no one was supposed to eat from that at all. And then, so here, uh, verse 19 to 26, I thought this was super interesting. The second ram was used for an additional sacrifice. And, and as I see it now, it's also a form of communion, essentially, uh, because after um, Aaron and his sons are consecrated and cleansed, they're able to eat and dine in fellowship with God. So after they make another sacrifice, um, they, that's why the last part says take the breast. And we all know chicken breast is fire, so I'm pretty sure ram breast tastes pretty good too. And uh, especially if you've had like a gyro, they may not go, I don't know. But, <laughs> but um, yeah, it's just, I think that's really powerful that God allows us to eat and dine with him even after you know, our sin and everything else because we've been cleansed to be in front and be with him. So yeah. So those are the major differences between the two rams that I've seen so far. Yeah, good stuff, man. Um anyone else? Uh yeah, so um so I was looking up uh the wave offering itself, um, because I was just curious as to what a wave offering was. Um, and then uh, through that, I found a uh, sort of like a study guide um, over the chapter itself. Um, and one part that really brought my, uh, that piqued my attention was the final portion where, uh, where after the wave offering, uh, the rest of the ram was, or the rest of the ram was uh, there to, uh, there's to share. And so I want to read off this, uh, this study guide here uh, verbatim about uh, just eating in general. So it says here, uh, in a way, eating is a good picture of a healthy, continuing relationship with Jesus. Uh, eating is personal. No one can eat for you, and no one can have a relationship with Jesus on your behalf. Eating is inward. It does no good to be around food or to rub food on the outside of your body. You must take it in. We must take Jesus unto ourselves inwardly and not merely in an external way. Um, so essentially not, uh, not falsely proclaiming like, yeah, I read the Bible every day, or, you know, I know everything about, uh, about God, what he's done for me. But then when you really look into it, you know, you're just not, uh, your heart isn't truly into it. You're just saying things just to be, uh, just to be the center of attention. Um, and thirdly, they say eating is active. Um, so they make an example regarding, uh, medicines where medicines, uh, work, uh, passively. Um, so they, they do go, uh, within, you know, and they work while you sleep, but, that's not something you can do uh, while you can't eat while you're sleeping. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, you have to proactively, uh, you know, feed your body um, with sustenance uh, every day. And, you know, for a lot of folks, every, uh, every few hours, otherwise your body's going to give out on you. Um, and that's similar to how we should look at um, building our relationship with God and with Jesus and everybody just to make sure that, you know, we're getting that uh, continuous sustenance. Um, and that's not something that we can do uh, passively. You know, we can't just absorb something like food. Uh, you know, we have to actively eat it. We have to actually put that in our mouths. We have to ingest it and all that. Um, you know, that's, and that's something personal. You, like it says, no one else can do that for you but yourself. Um, so that's something I really liked about this, uh, this study guide here. It's, it was really something that I never really thought about um, when it came to just eating in general. Um, cause I never like eat a burger and just think, yes, yeah, this, this is all me. No, nobody else going to eat this burger for right. me. It's not going to sustain me. If somebody else takes a bite of it, you know, I don't get any energy from that. I don't get, you know, satisfaction, but that's, you know, it's same way that's applied to, uh, you know, when we were studying, um, uh, God's word and really just reaffirming our connection with them. You know, that's something that nobody else can do. Everyone else can, uh, help you find the right direction to go in to start your journey, but no one else can take that journey for you. Um, so that's, that's what I really like about that section. Yeah. Amen. Uh, that's actually really good. <laughs> A good read. Uh, I didn't even receive all of that from, from this, but, uh, definitely made some revelations to me. Holy crap. Uh, <laughs> anyone else? Dave, you've been kind of quiet. Uh, something yeah. I would um, think about when, uh, 22, when 
and uh, I think it's like a cyclist is like um, it was in uh, parentheses to kind of emphasize it's like this is the lane for the orientation from the white um, motivation ordination out oh. ordination. Yeah, I was going to watch that as a club of book disease. And um, I don't think I actually had uh, it's just in how they just uh, take all of his pieces. Yeah, all of the fat, really. And so, <laughs> and then uh, place it in for, for the best. Okay. I just find it uh, more easy. That would be quest. It's like, I don't know if I have questions. It's like, what questions do I really ask? It's like, I don't have a question that even, I can't ask a question if I don't even understand a question. <laughs> or something like that. What? No, I was just saying to myself, I was like, I don't know, um, on this section right now, yeah, I'm asking myself. I just say don't. <laughs> Okay, I, I guess that's your way of saying you don't have any questions. Yeah. Uh, um, by the way, does anybody know what ordination means? Is that ordination like, I want to say, not the, I mean, ordinary be like the August thing, but ordination is kind of kind of like um it's, it's it's like um kind of like a old a cuff um ordering song or like uh it's i know it had to have to do with like kind of like a laws gathering or laws number or something that just represents it i don't think so um I just looked it up. Anybody else? Not me. I don't know either. So, um, what is what? What are they fulfilling by consecrating themselves? Uh, being made holy, uh, so they can be in the presence of God. Right. And so, with that. Why would they need to be holy or consecrated before they take on this position? Uh, just like I think Sean said earlier, like in, in order to be employed by God, you have to be washed. Okay, and so what's something that kind of reminds you of ordination, meaning that you are chosen by God? I don't know why I'm thinking they of parents as ordination. I could be wrong though. Is that is 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 ordination included in marriage or is it something else? That's part of this it's part of the ceremony. Um well you would need somebody that's or oh to like not make ordinary anymore or, or to make <laughs> ordinary uh I guess, well, it would be ordinary in the sight of God, but it would be uh, to be like him, in essence. Yeah, I, I think I'm losing. I think I'm losing, uh, losing you guys. Um, ordained. Okay. That's what the ordination is, is, is yeah. basically, is basically the process of receiving the position that God has given you. And so they had to be consecrated so they can be prepared for the mission that they were ordained for. Right? Hmm. So yeah, I thought that was interesting. I just read that. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, uh, the ram was made. So they were not, um, they were not prepared to receive this, this position until that ram was, was basically a uh, sacrifice and be able to be, you know, I guess distributed amongst the people as far as, you know, uh, you had a portion that went to the Lord. 
he had a portion that went to the priests themselves, and then he had some that went to the Israelites, and they were all able to share and eat that in fellowship. Or it's basically, they they had to um, they, they basically celebrated the fact that now they are they're consecrated, they're they're, they're sanctified, and um, what that reminds me of is kind of like the Last Supper in that, you know, after the Lord, you know, you know, took the disciples, anointed, uh, anointed them and, uh, you know, washed them, made them clean. Um, they celebrated by eating together. You know what I mean? And so that's kind of the, like this process is kind of like, once again, it's kind of showing the events that led up to the crucifixion in that that Jesus made them clean. They had to go to Jesus to be cleaned once that once you know Jesus served them, they all celebrated. you know or if you think about you know when we uh, take communion it is kind of the same process if you think about it yeah that's interesting um anyone else any questions we cover, we move on? did we cover um wave offering yet we would ask about that yet i can't remember uh, about the wave offering cam did. okay i I I touched, on the uh the sharing of the food at the end of it but i didn't touch like the actual like yeah uh, the offering itself i guess if yeah that makes sense i, I was kind of curious about it i didn't find too much except for obviously a lot of people just keep saying well it's a for the sacrifice of the lord I'm like, well, yeah obviously but there's a <laughs> yeah. chart somewhere mm-hmm. that i found i gotta find the chart again but it it um it, it had a uh, columns and rows to Give the distinctions between each different offering. So the sin offering versus then like the bull offering that represented the ram offering. So for like the pigeon, like even for poor people, they were supposed to sacrifice like a pigeon and they couldn't find uh, a dove or something like that. Because you know pigeons are the rats in the sky essentially. So yeah, <laughs> I've been looking out for them too, you know. <laughs> mm-hmm. Like there's no excuse not to sacrifice them, essentially is what he was saying. But um I when I think of wave offering, I, I Think about just um, like a white flag in war means surrender, right? And so, like saying that you're waving this to God means I surrender this um, essentially, or, or this is a part of my sacrifice essentially. You know, this is dedicated to you that I get the best, all because of you and I acknowledge you. You know, um, I even think of uh, roots when uh, Kunta Kinte's father held him up in the air. You know, he waved him to God mm-hmm. saying. I dedicate you to God, you know? Um, yeah. I know maybe some of you might have been dedicated in church, uh, you know, like they take the baby up front and they get the, the family to come around and they pray over it and over the life of the baby. Or and if that hadn't happened to you, you might have seen it in church coming up as well. Um, and if not, I encourage you to do that for your own children in the future. Um, but yeah, that's what I just thought of something uh, with the wave offering it's just, like it's it's surrendering and acknowledging that God is over you. You know the only the only way that you got this is because of Him. So yeah, mm-hmm. especially for that moment because the only way they could eat is they were consecrated. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um. Yeah, I don't, I don't have scripture to support it, but just by looking it up and just a second ago, um, basically a wave offering is really just like, once again, what Jerm said, uh, surrender, but also towards, uh, towards like being in service to God and choosing to serve God, you know? And so um, if you think about it, um, I, once again, I don't have scripture to support this, so I could be completely wrong. But um, if 
you think about it, what would we not have if we if we don't work? <laughs> if we don't work, we don't eat. So by burning, you know, food, it's like saying, you know, I wouldn't have this if I did not do this in service to God. And so it's like I'm giving back kind of like, it's like almost like, it's like almost having a tithe, I assume. You know what I mean? Because this, uh, the things that were burning, they weren't burning. Um, I don't think they were burning the uh, the loaves or or the not the loaves. They weren't burning the like the ram like meat or anything like that. They were burning like oil covered you know loaves or the the uh, the unleavened bread and like taking a portion of it, burning it and that was them saying, you know, I am in service to God. And I don't think it was just uh, the priests that were doing it. I think maybe even the the Israelites did it. But once again, I don't have scripture to support this, so I could be completely wrong. So Sean, if you, if you have anything, definitely step in. <laughs> yeah, I think it all relates. So I'm trying to think how I want to answer it. Because, like, honestly, I wish I just would have focused on this chapter and then study, study 30 at all. Otherwise, I'd be done with my studying. But My bad, dude. <laughs> nah, that's cool. Um, but, like, I, I went to the bathroom just now. So, Cam, did you say what you said, what a heave offering was? Yeah, because I, I think you said that you, you studied it earlier. You said it real quick. Uh, the section I covered was just the... Uh what I found while I was studying uh, or looking up the wave offering um, and in the, the portion where they, uh, where they share the Rambies what uh, caught my attention because it was just something that, uh, something that we would normally think is just uh, completely automatic. You know, we're, we're going to eat at some point, you know, we don't really think about uh, the process of it, but uh, I really like the way uh, that this person noted down, like just how closely eating, in, uh, in its entirety, is just such a uh, good representation of uh, a continuous and healthy relationship with uh, with Jesus. But that was all I had for that one. So I, I already uh, <laughs> I already covered all that uh, sometime earlier. Okay. Now I wish I knew more about it. I just know that if I give my points, I can get to uh, the answer to that question. Because the way I want to answer it. I don't know if it's right or wrong, but I know it pertains to all the points that I have that I got from the other verses. Because essentially a wave offering is just like a representation of God. Because literally that verse said, uh, in verse 26, it says, and wave it for the wave offering before the Lord, and it shall be thou part. So I'm guessing it was cooked, right? And then it was eaten by the priests. Mm-hmm. That's correct. Yeah, so because one offering, because the second offering was the best parts of the animal. So, and the, I guess the best part of the animals, like you put together the bread, cake, and wafer, like it said in the other verses before that. I can't remember. And then, uh, yeah, then you you wave it before the Lord in act of presentation, you know, for the you know for the offering, right? So. Yeah, I forgot what the answer to the question was. I mean, the question, but the question was, is what a, what is a wave offering? Yeah. Right. But yeah, I mean, I'm just go over my points, okay? Then I can get to that answer to the question. Because like, we totally skipped over it. Nobody said anything about the the ear, the toe, and the and the thumb. Which, oh, crap, I forgot. Yeah. Which stood out to okay. me the most. I'm going to let y'all talk about it. I'm not even going to say it. I want to hear what y'all got to say about it. <laughs> Because then I'll I can't. Be honest, I actually don't know <laughs> okay. what that did. And I, I forgot to, to study that because I was so focused on the first and second round meetings. But mm-hmm. if someone else studied, please please let me know. Because that's going. Because I, I am curious. Yeah, that's going to yeah, answer your question, that. bro, about the wave offering. That that literally okay. goes right to it. Oh, it does. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Hey, let me. Uh... <laughs> nah, go ahead, Miles. Uh, yeah. All right. So first. Um, 
we all know what the representation of the blood is. W what is that? Real quick, somebody. Life. Blood of Christ. Right. And what does the blood do? It never Everybody loses its power. About the blood. What's the blood? <laughs> exactly. What's the power? What power is it? Jesus. The blood that Jesus shed for me. Way up on Calvary. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> It gives me strength. What is the blood's what is the blood's power? Because I mean I can I can I can take some blood and just throw it on you, but what's the difference between my blood and Jesus' blood? It saves. Oh, I'm answering all the questions. It cleanses us. <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> so why would we want the blood to be placed on the ear? our thumb, and our toe. So let's start with the ear. Why would I want Jesus' blood to be able to cleanse my ear? Hmm. Uh, when you said the the, um, the ear, the thumb, the toe, I just thought about the three kind of, well, two um, senses. Well, the ear, of course, when it, the ear, you want to like heal, um, his, I mean, not here, but uh, hear all this around, hear your surroundings. Your thumb, you want to feel uh, this presence, and the toe, you want to walk on that land and walk. Uh, yeah, just walk on that land. Uh, those are the first things I think of. Mm -hmm. I like those I would, answers. Let's go a little deeper. Yeah, go ahead. I would say for the ears, um, for a large majority of humanity is uh, most of what we learn or come across is uh, is audio or oral or through uh, you know through our ears we listen to uh, to other conversations we listen to uh, sermons we listen to uh, really just any sort of teachings that we get and really just kind of uh, you know cleansing our ears like that is a way to help us uh, try to filter out everything that tries to make us stray away um, from what God has intended for us and uh, work on just blocking out those, uh, you know, all the negativity or block out um, those that are saying, you know, hey, uh, you know, what you're, uh, you know, what you're studying, you know, your God is wrong or something like that. You know, it's, it's a way of just uh, assisting us to uh, take in all the, uh, all the necessary uh, information that God wants us to learn or hear and be able to absorb that within ourselves um, and apply it to, uh, to what we do in our daily lives. Um, and hearing is something that uh, kind of along with what uh, Abe was trying to get across was that, uh, you know, we have, <laughs> we have these five senses and, uh, you know, if we lose one of them, then we're severely uh, hampered or, you know, disabled as most folks like to call it. So with hearing gone, you know, we would be, uh, I mean, there's still ways to get around that with sign language or just, you know, just reading, but uh, the audio, you know, some folks are auditory uh, learners. Um, and without that sense or without, uh, without God assisting us in what we uh, take in through our, uh, through what we hear and being able to filter out what we, uh, what we should take to heart and what we should, uh, you know, repel from us, you know, we're, we would just be uh, kind of dead in the water, essentially, if we didn't have that. I'm gonna let, I'm gonna, I'm gonna let you guys finish off on thumbs and uh, feet, and then I'm gonna have two questions that's gonna blow your freaking mind. Um, so, let's go to the thumbs. Why would we want our thumbs, and by the way, Cam, you're right about the ears. Um, why would we want our thumbs to be cleansed by the blood of Jesus. Why thumbs? Thumbs, you, could really, you can't really do anything with your hands. Um, right. Yeah, so, you can't grab onto anything. You can't, <laughs> it's, yeah. Yeah, it's the very simple thing of doing. It's like our actions. We want, we want God to be able to cleanse and be active in our actions. The things that we, you know, the things that we do, the things we aspire to do, you know. All right, so that's one. That's another one. What about feet? 
Why, why, why the feet? Especially the big toe. Like, why the feet? Uh, the big toes are pretty much our, uh, it's pretty much the foundation of how we're able to keep our balance and really just stand up right. Um, because, you know, missing any toe on your feet, you know, is going to hamper you a little, but, you know, say if I were to miss my, uh, like my third toe or my fourth toe, you know, those, those are like in the middle, but I still have, you know, a little pinky toe at the end and then the big toe just keeping me from falling in on myself. But those big toes, if you ever tried like walking while keeping your big toes up, like it, it's very hard to keep your balance and you're not going to be able to walk straight. And so that's, uh, so we need the big toes or the foundation to keep us walking straight forward um, in our path to uh, eventually making our way to God. It's just, we have to make sure we're able to uh, keep our feet going in a straight path and not deter away from what God has planned for us. Yeah, I was just thinking about that, going in a straight path, because you don't want to stumble when you're just uh, going along to uh, God. You want to, like, yeah, go straight forward without any uh, obstacles in your way. And big toe is really important for uh, your feet and human body. Amen. Uh, I was also, also going to say something about the thumb, and I just thought about this, uh, just to kind of backtrack before we move on. But, you know, we use our thumbprints as our identities a lot of times. So if, if Jesus is dark, as, if our new identity is found in Christ, you know, his blood is on top of our, our thumbs, you know? So, mm -hmm. yeah, that's pretty much, yeah, like how it relates to identity in Christ. Amen. Especially in this era. <laughs> Amen. All right, so now I'm about to blow your minds. Um, so we have our ears so we, that we can be able to hear the things that God wants to communicate to us and for us to receive it in our brains. We have our thumbs so that God can be able to guide, you know, our hands, our th the things that we want to do any goal that we have that involves us, you know, having to be active in the process, we want God to be there with us. And then we have God guiding our steps with our feet and our toes, right? And so mm -hmm. Abe was mentioning something about our five senses. And there's two things that we don't have blood on. Our eyes and so we can be able to see and our, um, our smell, our sense of smell. Why do you think that is? Because you would want to be able to see God, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah. I, I don't know. I mean, I'm pretty sure God smells great, but, you know. You can smell um, something's wrong, like something's a lot in or smell uh, danger. Uh, so you don't want to, uh, you want to have a sense of smell for like uh Maybe that's less uh, aroma, because I wonder uh, if something like aroma was in to play. Well, I mean, evidently not if we're not putting, if, if we're not in this process, because, I mean, this is, this is the process of getting consecrated. This is being sanctified. We all would, like, want to seek that, right? And so why would, why would, why would we not? receive Jesus's blood on like our sight and our sense of smell. Hmm. Anyone? So let's start with our eyes. For, for Jesus to cleanse our eyes for us to be able to see. Why would he not want us to see? clear maybe so that we could be guided by him yeah what's that what's that thing about faith uh, so there's a lot of people right now they don't believe because they don't see right and that we walk by faith and not by sight And so even if we don't see, physically see God, by faith we still trust him. Oh, wait. 
There's King. <laughs> Welcome back. All right, you here? Okay, can you hear us now? Yeah. Okay. For some odd reason, the audio just decided to cut out. <laughs> okay. I, I, I did that, but every so often. So I had asked, what is, what about faith, uh, you know, operates in that we cannot, that, that, that we won't need to be able to like see. Mm -hmm. That's what, uh, Jerem was saying around the time that we, uh, <laughs> lost the audio connection. So, yeah. Um, I mentioned it before and I, I don't know if anybody else wants to pick that up, but, uh, we operate by faith and not by sight. A lot of times we'll be misguided by the things that we see rather than the things that God has instilled in us, either through our, our, our hearing, our, um, our, our walk, and the things that God has allowed us to do, you know? And so that's one thing. we got eyes. That's why eyes are not a part of this, <laughs> of, of this consecration process. By faith, we put we keep our eyes on God. By faith, right? And so now the sense of smell. Why why would smell not be something that we would want God or the the blood of Jesus to be able to come through and cleanse? This one's kind of tough. Oh yeah, yeah anything what 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 about smell would i guess kind of similar to eyes would misguide us i mean we could be you know misled or tempted with the aroma of something boom there it is i wish i could right now I kind of say it to a woman. <laughs> Yeah, with this, I like I kind of like to think about how like in cartoons, um, like they'll have you know such and such um, mammy representation of a black woman place a pie out on a windowsill, and you would see either Tom and Jerry or or uh, or or some some strange like cartoon creature thing be guided by just smell, and sometimes it would ultimately lead them into a trap. And so sometimes because we'll be chasing after our flesh, the things that may smell or, or, or attract us, um, sometimes those things can lead us astray, similar to eyes in that something looks appealing. It may not be good for you, but it looks appealing. So why not, you know? And so that, that's all I kind of wanted to <clears throat> mention towards that in um, this, this process of, you know, placing the blood on the ear, the thumb and the toe, things like that. Um, I don't have an explanation as to why it's specifically the right one, but um, that's, that's kind of my explanation as to why those things. You said a white toe? Yeah, because I mean, they have, don't you usually walk like you start off? You walk with your right. Well, I mean, not left-footed people. <laughs> well, that then the footed people left. Well, no, no, no. Uh, oh, <laughs> Some people are lefties. You right us. Sorry for being racist to the left guy. <laughs> Anyways, but yeah, uh, for these uh, for these steps in tw uh, in verse twenty, it says to put it on the lobes of the right ears. The right hands, the right, uh, the right feet. I I don't know it specifically why it's the right one. I think I think Sean might know uh, because it has something to do with um, it's it's in Revelation, isn't it? About like uh, the saved ones are on the right side, and the 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 ones that are damned to hell will be on his left, or the or the the lambs are on the right side and the goats are on the left, something mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. And Cam answered it earlier, bro. Like, I forgot what Cam said now because I'm in the spot now. But um, yeah, yeah, Cam said that it's most common, right? More people are right handed. Like, that's a fact, right? 
especially in this time period, like this time period, they look down upon anybody that's left-handed. If you're left-handed, you consider you got a handicap. We'll see that like in the book of Judges when like one of God's appointed judges stabs a king or something like that. I don't know his name, but, and he was left-handed and everybody looked down upon him, but God used him. So like, that's why he's so significant because you know, that, that pertains to our life and stuff, right? But anyways, like right-handed is considered uh, more superior than the left, obviously. It's considered, uh, it, it's so many people, that means it's more strength and skill. And people that's right-handed, it's more feasible kind of, you know what I'm saying? And then also like going back to what Jeremiah said, like the right, it just, it's, it's uh, considered power. You know what I mean? Like it's back in that time period, like right-handed people. I mean, you get what I'm trying to say. I don't have to explain it. But anyways, like God wanted, like this, uh, it points, it points out right hand so much. Like it's three things that's right hand, right? Like right ear, right toe, right thumb. Like basically God was saying like, he wanted your best dedicated to him. So like, I want to add to what Miles just say was just saying this, like, why did God put her on the ear, the toe and the thumb? Like, that was great. Like the, you know, the work is, you know, the, the thumb is for working, you know, the hand and your toiling and your ear for hearing, you know, <laughs> uh, it's a scripture verse. I can't remember right now. And then walk, walking, right. You know, walk with the Lord. He didn't say run with the Lord and stuff like that. He said, walk with, walk in the spirit, all that stuff. So yeah, man. But anyways, like with all that, God was just trying to say like to the consecrated priests, like who stained with the blood sacrifice, right? So you're staying with Jesus, man. You're consecrated for Jesus, right? So you should hear differently than everybody else. Cause the blood is on your ear. You should walk differently than everybody else. Cause the blood is on your thumb. <laughs> With work, you should toil more than everybody else. You should stand out, right? And you should walk differently than everybody else because the blood is on your feet. And it's on your right side, your best side, right? So you, you, you should be giving God your best with everything that you do. So like, yeah, that's one of the points I wanted to make with that. But then also like the sacrificial lamb, man, like, oh, well, I'm keep on saying it, man. The sacrificial victim, sacrificial lamb. Like, obviously that sounds like Jesus, right? And there's power in the blood, like Leviticus 17, 11, bro. It says, for the life of the creature is in the blood. You know, we always hear the life was in the blood, you know, for the life of the flesh is in the blood, in the blood of Christ, bro. Like he gives you what you need to be able to do this, bro. Like they have put the, put the sacrifice on themselves. Then all, and then also they, I think they sprinkled the second one on themselves, right? The, the blood of the second one, something like that. And they put oil on 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 uh on Aaron and his sons too, you know, on their garments and everything. So they sprinkled the blood in the oil. So why do y'all think they sprinkled the blood in the oil? I just told you what the blood is. I just told you. we know what the oil is because Tim already said it. Like, and we talked about it last lesson. So why would they sprinkle the blood in the oil on the priest? Well, more specifically, their garments. Oh they yeah, their garments. The yeah. On their garments, yeah, that's even more problem. <laughs> <laughs> so the garments that God's giving you, why would he sprinkle the blood in the oil? Basically to prepare the position. Right. Those two go hand in hand with the body of Christ as well as the Holy Spirit. Right. You, know, you really can't uh one without the other. So would anybody ever tell you like the Trinity ain't in the Bible or something like that? Especially not in the old bro. You got this verse right here, like verse 21, and thou shalt take the blood of that is upon the altar and the anointing oil and sprinkle it upon Aaron and upon his garments and upon his sons. Like it keeps on going, bro. And they'll be hallowed. You know, they'll be honored. I mean, they'll be consecrated. Like you get what I'm saying? So like, like this pertains to us. The life application is like, you can't do life without Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Like the Holy Spirit is the oil. Jesus is the blood. Like you need that mixture. You can't do it without one, without the other. Like I'm gonna wait to do any other point because like the, the next section pertains to everything that we just said. Yeah. And we've been here forever, bro, on one chapter. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, there's a lot in this chapter though. Yeah. Um, how about this? Who feels like reading? I'll, uh, let's take 27 through 37 and then uh, somebody else can close it afterwards. I'll do 27 through 37. Uh, and I'll close out. Yeah. I'm reading from a different version, so bear with me. Yeah. Uh, 27. 
Consecrate for Aaron and his sons the breast of the presentation offering that is laid in the dive of the contribution that is lifted up from the ram of the ordination. This will belong to Aaron and his sons as a regular portion for the Israelites, for it is yeah, for it is a contribution. It will be the Israelites' contribution from their fellowship sacrifices, a contribution to the Lord. The holy garments that belong to Aaron are to belong to his sons after him, so that they can be anointed and ordained in them. Any priest who is who is one of his sons and who succeeds him and enters the tent of meeting to minister in the sanctuary must wear them for seven days. You are to take yeah, 34. You are to take the ram of ordination and boil its flesh in a holy place. Aaron and his sons are to eat the meat of the ram and the bread that is in the basket at the entrance to the tent of meeting. They must eat those things by which atonement was made at the time of their ordination and consecration. An unauthorized person must not eat them, but these things are holy. If any of the meat of the ordination or, or any of the bread is left to bring, burn up what is left over, it must not be eaten because it is holy. Uh, I'm going to 37 then. I am? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Is it me? This, this is what you are to do for Aaron and his sons based on all the uh, on all I have committed you. Ordain them for seven days. Sacrifice a bull as sin offering each day for atonement. Purify the altar when you make atonement for it. Anoint it in order to consecrate it. For seven days you must make atonement for the altar and consecrate it. The altar will become especially holy. Whatever touches the altar will become holy. Amen. And um, eighth, when, well, do you guys feel like we should just go ahead and get ready to close that out and so we can talk about everything that's available? <laughs> or uh, do you want to talk about the section we just read first? Uh, I would probably say, let's go ahead and close it out. Okay. Anyone else? Yeah, I close it up. Okay. Hey, if go ahead and close uh, close this up. Yeah. 38 through 46. Yeah. This is what you are to offer on the altar regularly each day. Two lamps a year old. The other one in the morning and the other at twilight. With the first lamp of, of a tenth of an epith of the finest flower mixed with a quarter of a hem, a hen. Press olives and a quarter of a hen of a wine as a drink offering. Sacrifice the other lamb at twilight with the same grain offering and his drink offering as in the morning. A pleasing aroma of food offering presented to the Lord. For the generations to come, this burnt offering is to be made regularly at the entrance to the tent of Ethan before the Lord. There I will meet you and speak to you. There also I will meet with the Israelites and the place will be consecrated by the, my glory. So I will consecrate the tent of meeting and the altar and will consecrate Aaron and his sons to serve me as priests. Then I will dwell among the Israelites and be the God. They will know where I am, the Lord, the God, who brought them out of Egypt so that I might dwell among them. I am the Lord, the God. Amen. All right, so anything, last comments and everything <laughs> on this section and chapter. So, just a curious question, why, um, why did I mention uh, Twilight uh, so light? Is any specific reason or they just like, want to say it like that? I actually had a, uh, a comment on that section. Um, so when I had looked through this, um, I was thinking that uh, you know, when they mention the morning and the twilight, um, and since we're uh, talking about sacrificing uh, two lambs here, I'm thinking that was uh, once again referring to uh, to Jesus. Um, really, in the uh, if we take the old uh, the old riddle that we find about the Sphinx, where it asks uh, what has uh, what four legs in the morning, uh, two legs in the afternoon, three legs at night, um, and we usually uh, associate. Uh, morning or the dawn as like a new beginning or uh in this case uh the birth of jesus um is ba is basically the starting point which would eventually lead to uh jesus's twilight years which would be when he's about to be uh when he's about to sacrifice himself 
uh, to atone for our sins. Um, that's that uh, that twilight. So that's what I was. Uh, that's what I was thinking as far as uh, mm. why they chose morning and twilight specifically. It's really good, Cam. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Mm, that that a lot. <laughs> I don't know. So kind of the, yeah. <laughs> I didn't know that. Um, anyone else? Any questions? Uh, I was thinking about um, back in Egypt, you know, like uh, when, the, when the Passover happened and God instructed the Israelites that whatever is left over from the land that they were to like, eat from, that they had to burn it up because it was holy and like nobody else could eat it. And so um, let me make sure I didn't write down for this section. Hold on, guys. Uh, I, I had studied 30 as well. <laughs> and I give you my points mixed up with both chapters. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, so this kind of reiterated itself throughout the whole thing, but I don't know if you, if you guys kind of noticed this, but God is also making a separation, not, not only with his own people, but like inside of his people. So like he's making the priests separate from the rest of the people, although they're already called to be a holy nation. Essentially, even inside of this covenant, he's still like, um, you know, this group of people has this job, and only they can eat this, and only they can do this the way I've instructed. Nobody else can do that. So it's kind of reiterated throughout the entire chapter, but specifically, I want to kind of bring it home um, again uh, in this final section with just, uh, yeah, it's like, it's like not a second Passover, essentially, but the instructions are very similar uh, to, to what they have to do in Egypt. You know? um, yeah. So that, that distinction, again, not only from the rest of the world, but inside of his own nation is, is interesting. And that's it for me. <laughs> yeah, amen. Um, anyone else? Sean, you don't have to wait. <laughs> Bro. Yeah, I already got my way because yeah. they ain't set me up for it. <laughs> yeah. uh, say no more with this. Just... <laughs> yeah, Miles, go ahead and go, and then I'll go after. I got, we don't have time to cover all this, bro. We already out of time. So. <laughs> yeah, honestly, I don't have a lot uh, other than just pointing out the obvious number of, you know, uh, was it uh, the whole process took seven days? You know what I mean? And that, uh, the Lord, not the Lord, uh, God, when he, whenever he created, you know, earth and everything created life, uh, it took seven days and the seventh day was like for rest. And so I, I thought that was interesting. Uh, but yeah, Sean, go, man. You have plenty of time <laughs> for now. My question is just with going through this chapter, um, I want you guys to answer these questions like because this is the questions I thought about when I went through this chapter like is God more concerned about fulfilling uh, your purposes or, or his so is God more concerned about fulfilling uh, your purposes or his and then is your worship of God more closely related to a biblical inspired and scripturally sound form of worship that we read throughout the scriptures or is it if, or is your worship more related to the worldly approach of having a good time, a celebration, a party, a nightclub experience? Man, you don't have to answer that question. Ooh. But oh, oh, Sean, just just to kind of interrupt uh, a little bit, but just um, speaking of that, when I was reading this, I kind of thought of the second part it was like, you know, our worship experience and stuff like that. And there's an article I'll, I'll put it up in, in the chat later, but it was just like. Uh, why the modern worship experience is almost masturbatory or self-serving you know like you said it's like it looks like it's just about having a good time self-glorifying even though it looks like we're glorifying god but really we're just trying to get this high or something like that so i'll, I'll put it in the chat later but anyhow i'm glad you said that I gotta find it again <laughs> anybody else want to answer those questions uh I completely, you know, my brain just lost your first question. Oh, uh, uh, is God more concerned about fulfilling your purposes or his? Because some people think like God is a genie. He should do what I want. No. You know, a lot a of people think that. Like, you I know, think to me, oh, go it ahead. feels like, uh, 
to me, the first one almost feels like a loaded question because um, our purposes are what uh, God has set for us as far as like what the best for be. for how we how how it should be um, for us. So I, so I feel like it's those two are uh, pretty much one and the same because um, it's not. I mean, we could. We all, we can always attempt to try to uh, try to break that uh, break that not timeline but that uh, the schedule that God has for us, um, which goes back to uh, back when I uh, discussed about uh, patience. You know, we uh, we could try to go against that, but really all we're doing is just leading ourselves to a harder life instead of like truly giving ourselves uh, give ourselves up to God and uh, you know giving Him giving him the wheel to our life, just steering us in the right direction. Um, so I feel like, uh, the purpose that we're, uh, that we're destined to, uh, fulfill is pretty much the same interest that God has, uh, for us and for, for everything. Really. Okay. So like, I'm gonna stick with my, my answer of, uh, our purposes should align with God's. Mm -hmm. And if it doesn't, you know, God is only going to do, he's going to do his part and he's only going to go as far as you allow him to go. And so it's like, if you are a Christ follower, if you do, you know, want to follow and, and chase after God, uh, of course, you're, you're going to align your goals with the things that God wants for you. And if you have your, your own motivation, you have your own things that don't match up with what God wants, you're just going to live a hard life, but God's still going to continue doing what he does. Um, now, that, that was pretty much what I was going to say. Yeah, man, this chapter, man, covers so much, bro. Like, when I, t but I really want to just take this, can we do this last part for the next 32? Like, chapter 30 in this y'all think we can make it because chapter 30 is actually shorter like it's only 30 verses or something like that 32 uh, i think we'll be able to, to squash it in but all i'm gonna say is is like oh go ahead Miles. i was gonna say if you have more uh towards this uh i mean you're you're perfectly you know capable you, you can reason you, you can like mention your points in for next Bible study. I know uh, Saturday, Saturday, uh, Jairus is supposed to be leading us uh, through a study. And then uh, next Wednesday, we'll be back to uh, Exodus 30. And so um, maybe you can mention it then if you want. Okay. Just don't forget. <laughs> yeah. Biggest thing was. Hang on. We say, what? Uh, Kim? I was going to probably just give something to uh, marinate on as far yeah. as your uh, points for that section. All right. So then if we do revisit it uh, Wednesday, then, you know, we can just kick off from there. Because, yeah, you know, we asked what a wave offering is, right? I feel like we didn't really answer the question too much. Because, like, a wave offering, bro, like, it's basically just them fellowshipping with God. Because, remember, they had the wave offer, so they had their portion to eat, but then God had his portion to eat, the one that was burnt, right? That was the pleasing, the uh, sweet uh, Amora that he was smelling. So like while the people were eating, God was eating too. So both people were satisfied. And like, basically this whole chapter is like pointing to, is it points towards your relationship with God in like so many ways, bro. It's ridiculous, man. Like it talks about worship. Like I basically just ask you guys, can you worship God any kind of way you want? Based on how we read this chapter, can you just live how you want to live? and not do what God said to do and, and just be do stuff that's pleasing to him, right? Like verse 25 literally says, blah, 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 for <laughs> you're going to give a burnt, burnt offering for a sweet savor before the Lord. It is an offering by fire unto the Lord. Like, can you just throw up anything and give it to God? Like, so worship, worship is all about God. Like your life is all about God and what he wants, man. And if you don't worship God the right way, you're not going to get revelation. Like this last part was crazy, bro. Exodus 29, 42 to 43. Let's read it. It says, this shall be a continual burnt offering throughout your generations at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before the Lord, where I will meet you and speak there unto thee. 
So guys, if you come to God any type of way, if you do what you want to do and live how you want to live, is God going to meet with you there? Is he going to speak unto you? Like everybody feels like God is so far away. A lot of people feel like they don't know God. A lot of people put their faith in a pastor and what other people say. And like, that's what their faith is all about. What other people have said instead of what God's word said, because they don't know God's word for themselves. They don't know God for themselves. And that's the, there's a reason why for that, because you're not coming to him the way he says to come to him. You can't have the, the garments. You can't. You're not even going to get close to the tabernacle if you don't humble yourself. It's not about you. You know what I'm saying? Like, there's so many levels to this. You know, like Miles said that one time. And I, I, I keep on playing back the videos. but <laughs> So, yeah, man, like, man, God wants to meet you. In, like, verse 43, it says, And there I will meet with the children of Israel. And the tabernacle shall be sanctified by my glory. Like sanctified means like you'll know my purposes. Like you want to know why you don't know God's will for your life. You want to know why you don't know your, you know, uh, what to do with your life because you ain't been sanctified because you haven't, you haven't heard from God. He hasn't spoken to you. He can't, he hasn't met with you, right? You're his child, right? You should hear from him. You're God's creation. Like worship leads to revelation. But you're not going to receive no revelation if you don't worship God the right way. You know, his work won't be accomplished, you know, unless he's glorified, unless he's manifest, unless his glory is manifested. Like a lot of people live for themselves. Like these priests, they, they couldn't afford to do that. We can't either. Right? We owe God our life. We owe God everything. And we'll talk about that with Exodus 30. We're going to tear that up. man. I can't wait. That's why I probably just wait to say everything I want to say. But like, Man, like we owe God everything. He has done way too much for us, especially when we read his word and we take what he said in his word as truth. Like, man, we can come to his tabernacle any time. You know what I'm saying? Like, man, he has done so much, bro. And like, you're, you're called by him for his purposes, bro. And like, you're not going to function in his purposes <laughs> unless like you're in his will. Unless you've been sanctified, unless you've been consecrated. Like, and this goes like every verse in this chapter, like points that at the end, like verse 44. Let's go to that. And I will sanctify the tabernacle of the congregation in the altar. And I will sanctify also both Aaron and his sons to minister to me in the priest's office. Like, it literally said that part in verse one to minister to me in the priest's office. Like, I will sanctify, man. Like, God will function according to his purposes for them, right? So, God has a will for everybody. Like, but if the priest didn't come in the way that he wanted, man, you know, without the priesthood, God wouldn't have functioned. You know, he, <laughs> he wouldn't have brought a problem. He wouldn't have brought a pro brought, He wouldn't have brought his will to their lives the way he did. If they, if, you know, if uh, they weren't in line with his purposes, right? So like, they wouldn't have had him dwell in their midst. They wouldn't have had him speak to them if they would not, if they would not have obeyed. You know what I'm trying to say? So like, it's the same way yeah. with us, man. Like, yeah, man, th this is so crazy, bro. Like every verse was ridiculous. And then like, it keep on saying like, do this. They did a burnt offering regularly every day. Every time I saw that every day, regularly, like you have to do this every day. Like, and then on top of that, it said that the burnt offerings that they did do, they put it on the horns, right? They, they put it uh, on the horns of the altar. We'll see that in the next. I, I keep on spoiling the next chapter, but like they put it on there because, and they left it on there. Like, so in the, uh, I'm just going to spoil it. So like the altar of incense, I think that's what it's called right before the veil. Like these sacrifices, they were on the day of atonement. They would just put the blood on the horns. Right. And when people walk by it, cause remember priests could go into the holy place, but they couldn't go into the holy of holies. Right. But when they walk by a lot of these altars, I even think on the outside altars too, they could see the horns that had blood on it. So even if a sacrifice wasn't being made or it had already been made, they saw all the blood of the sacrifices on there. So they were continually reminded of like what it of the redemption that God has given them. You know, the, the second chance that God has given them. Like, and that's verse 45 to 46, man. Like God said, I would dwell among the children of Israel and I will be their God right? And they shall know that I am the Lord their God. But this is the main part that brought them forth 
out of the land of Egypt, that I will dwell among them, and I will, and I am the Lord their God. Like God saved you for a reason. Like you are in this Bible study for a reason. You have come this far with God for a reason. Like wherever God has brought you from. So God has brought me from many things. You know, being a people pleaser. That's the way. That's how I came to Christ. Like when I came to Christ, I put that down at the altar and I killed that. That was the biggest sin I had. <laughs> and so now I'm at a point, I don't give a dang what people think. I care more what God thinks than what man thinks, which is talks about this in this chapter too. So like, yeah, man, God delivered you for a reason. So what is that reason, man? God positioned you and gave you provisions, <laughs> you know, so his sanctifications and purposes can be manifested in you. And his glory will be will, will be revealed. But a lot of people look for themselves. They try to glorify themselves. So like obviously they're not going to be able to experience God with them and dwelling among them, among them, if it's all about you. You know what I mean? God can't position you. Just like he positioned Aaron and his sons. Uh if it's all about you. So man, like I wish I could just break down some more of it, but because like a lot of this stuff is so powerful, like with ministry. The wave offering, man. So uh, the wave offering was like, this is a uh, constant work and the hands are full. Let me read what I'm trying to say. I'm going to read verse 24. It's Exodus 29, 24. And thou shalt put all in the hands of Aaron and in the hands of his sons and shalt wave them for a wave offering before the Lord. So we asked what a wave offering was. And it, it literally says it in the name, like their offering that they did, they have to wave it before the Lord, right? So they had to position their hands in a point that was waving to God, like pray, when you praise God, right? So it signifies victory. You know what so I mean? Worship, like it's a worship offering. Right. Yeah. It's worship it's too. Like tithing, right. Essentially. Yeah. So I was going to ask it's, you. And the tithing okay. is an act of worship. Right. So yeah, you're raising your hands and you're being positioned in the will of God, right? So I was going to ask you guys, like, how can you be prosperous in life? What is your definition of victory and how can you obtain it? Because this is how they did it in this time period. Like, you want to be prosperous in all your ways? That's the scripture verse. I know y'all probably thinking about it. In Deuteronomy, it really says, if you meditate on the word day and night, you'll be prosperous in all your ways. You know, if you obey, y'all read that in the book of Proverbs, man, if you uh take if you take if you listen to wisdom you'll be prosperous in your ways like it was verses like that so like your definition yeah. of victory should be god's definition like you know the way god wants to use you that's how you get victory like when you're uh a recipient of his provisions then you can accomplish his will and obey his word because that's the only thing that matters right like pleasing him living for him and like even if you're struggling and you're in pain in life like and things aren't going your way your way it's going God's way because God it has uh, ordained those things to happen in your life and transpire. So just you praising him is victory. Just you having peace in life is victory. And just you raising your hand in worship is victory. Like that's because, you know I mean, it wasn't easy for these ministers. Like they, this was a challenging task. Like I can only imagine like being a priest like they were and just having to do this every day, like constantly. Like their hands were full, man. They had no time to like to play around or anything, take a break. Like they weren't like the rest of the tribes in Israel. Like they continually had to do this. And this speaks for Christians. Like if you're a child of God, bro, there's work to be done. Like you don't have time to play around, bro. Like there's too many people to be saved and you're not in control of saving anybody. You can't save nobody. All you can do is just use your gifts and your abilities. So like another question I had was like, you know, what is your ministry? Like, are your hands full? Like, <laughs> have you been tolling for the Lord? Like these guys are doing. Yeah, because like if you're trying to if you're trying to like work for God and stuff like that, you can't fill people's hearts unless God has filled your hands, right? Unless God has done something for you and touched you. Yeah, you can't you don't have anything to wave. So basically a wave offering is like a testimony. It's something to show the crowd. It's something to show. Like <laughs> you can't have a wave offering if God hasn't done anything for you. You you can't show the and they showed it to the congregation, right? And to the Lord. Like, so that's what a, a wave offering is. Like, just to describe it more, man. Like, basically, do you have something to offer to the world? 
in, into everybody, into God, into yourself. Like, what are you doing for God? Like, this was a testimony, man. Like, just showing everybody. But, yeah. Anybody got something they want to say? Uh, I think <laughs> I think that covers all of my points for today, man. Um, and I like how Cam talked about eating, bro. Y'all remember in uh, John six fifty six, it said Jesus said, "He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him." Mm -hmm. Bro, yeah. like that part was so powerful when they ate the sacrifice, and then uh, they burnt the offering, and it went up to God, right? And he smelled the aroma. So like, man, this is just talking about like your relationship with Jesus, bro. Like you got to eat to live, right? So how are you eating? Like, and I like what Cam said, you know, eating is personal. You know, no one can eat for you. And, but then also no one can have a relationship with Jesus on your behalf. Like nobody can be saved for you. Just because your mommy and daddy is saved and your dad's a pastor. I used to think of my dad's a pastor. My dad's dad's a pastor. Everybody in my family a pastor. Like I was saved too. No, I'm not. Like your relationship with Christ is personal it's dependent on you on your judgment day it's just gonna be you and god like so yeah that's something else i got too and then you know eating this inwardly you can't just look at food and be satisfied you got to actually take it in right so you got to take in jesus yeah. for yourself eat of him you don't eat of his flesh you can't dwell up you, you don't have him you don't know him and then eating satisfying like right it produces uh and and you need it so just the same way, man, you need Jesus, man. You need, you need God in your life. Without him, you're nothing. You'll never be satisfied. You're going to continually be trying to eat these stuff that the world gives you, and you'll never be satisfied. So, man, it was a lot in this chapter, bro. So much, man. I'm, I, and I'm surprised we went this long. I didn't think it would, we would go this long. <laughs> Yeah, because we had to stop at every, like every, <laughs> every section. But uh, we had some really good points in there. Uh, if there's nothing else anyone has to add, we can go ahead and start praying out. Uh, I don't have any more points left. I got nothing. Um, I'm gonna go ahead. And, I'm gonna pray us out today. Right. Uh, let's go ahead and do. Uh, Prayer request.